gotta eat. Dip my head when I pray. Full of meditation, got my head on straight. The battle of the devil with the strips all day. Ain't load and reload, precepts in his face. Stuck in a place when I'm dwelling on God. That's right. Witnesses and murk, got my soul on high. Vision after vision, gotta take me to the sky. Take a glass with these wings, so I might as well fly. Soul at peace, our corruption has to cease. And the days ain't east, still strong on my feet. Even though the flesh weak, my soul will it. In my secret chamber, me and God just chillin'. Me and Mikael, Gabriel, Uriel. Showing me the wicked in the gates of the hell. And in that moment, I felt something deep inside. A love I could feel, something I can't describe. It was more than life. Shalom, shalom, Yisrael, Yahonathan, that we with you here one day called the 29th of August, 2021. And that was from my brother, my dear Ak Joe, More Than Life, Yehuda Shalom, Yehuda Shalom, More Than Life. Now, we're on tour portion number 45. Last week on 44, we started in the last book of Moshe, Dibarim, which means words. Now, Yisrael, we are the only creation made after Yahweh's image and the only ones given the power that he has with words. We're the only ones that can use, that, that, that can speak as he does and create. That old saying that came from the era of Rav, sticks and stones may break my bones with words whenever it hurt me. One of the most untrue statements that can be made. Because though a tongue has no bones, it surely can break a lot of hearts. The words we use to tell our story, and I'm doing it here every week, impacts the reception and the response of that story. The importance of word choice molds and frames our relationships. If seeing is believing, then indeed hearing is confirmed. Confirming Shema. Shema. Shema is not just audibly hearing. It is hearing with discernment. Be careful, Yisrael, because your Lashon Hara can be forgiven, but it can never be forgotten. Once it is spoken, it cannot be taken back out of the memories of the air. And if you want power, want some extra power, put those words in a book. Isn't that what Moshe did? Isn't that what we're reading from now in these Torah portions? Remember the book of Eli? How the, 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 whoever, the, I forget the man's name, who was the, the counterpart to Eli, he was actually looking for a Bible. We didn't know that until towards the end of the, the story. He had his men out there raiding people and killing and pillaging, looking for a book, and that book was the Bible. Because with that, this was a post-apocalyptic world. With that, he can remake the world and renew the world by manipulating the words in the Bible. So words are powerful. You put them in a book that encapsulates that power. Read and heed. Yehonathan Dawi, we can hear Yahweh for Christians on the famous 1590 WFBR. Now, last week, Moshe's, Moshe, using the Barim, the power of words was telling the history of our journey and what he did was what I was trying to help you to understand more clearly what Moshe was saying is was he was using the names of their various stops they made to put a physical to to burn a physical image into the minds of this next generation who was about to cross the Yardon the Jordan and so that means it takes wisdom to take time to stop and look at 
words and more particularly the names which are specialized words because it told a deeper story that you didn't really get if you just read the book the names told a deeper a deeper story of what Moshe was sharing now he also spoke about the blindness of the law he spoke about the error his error in sending out the spies now in this week's Torah portion number 45 Wa e kanan, wa es kanan, which means, and I pleaded. Wa es kanan, and I pleaded. And here we're going to see how Moshe was pleading with Yahweh to get into the land, how he admonishes us to obey the laws. He sets up refugee cities, he recites the Ten Commandments, and of course, one of the most famous scriptures of the entire Old Testament, Deuteronomy 6 4, the Shema. Yeah, that's, that's just like uh, John 3, 16 in the New Testament. Everybody knows what that one is. Well, everybody knows Deuteronomy 6, 4. Now, in, it starts off this tour portion. And it goes, and it goes from Deuteronomy 3, 23 through 7 and 11. Now, and again, it starts off with Moshe once again pleading with Yahweh to let him into the land. Not to go in there and be in charge like he is now. But he never got a chance to keep the 613 because, you know, Moshe is the lawgiver. He is the law. He never got a chance to really keep the 613 because he was not in the land. All 613 cannot be kept without a standing temple and without being in the Kodesh land. That's the only way anyone could possibly keep the 613. So he wanted to go in there to do that. And here's, and Yahweh said, hey, you know what? Enough of that. Enough. Now, here's a man who 14 times, 14 times fell on his face and pleaded to Yahweh on our behalf, on the behalf of Israel, who, who rebelled and sinned. And each time, Yahweh went on and heard him. And then we noticed there was uh, some outcome for that. But 14 times, yet here he is, he couldn't even get Yahweh to hear his own plea for himself. Now we go to um, talking about these laws. See, I want you to see the deeper spiritual meaning of this, how Moshe, who is the lawgiver, was not allowed to erect Yisrael, Kodesh. That speaks to the future covenant or the eternal covenant. The law, likewise, will not be going into the eternal land. The law will not be with us for the better promises. Yahweh has something bigger, bigger than what Moshe's mind understood, as beautiful as it was. He was the only ever oracle in the history of the world. He was the actual oracle, but it was something bigger than that, and Moshe didn't understand that. Let me go to Isaiah 49, 1 through 7. In my first scripture reading today. Isaiah 49, I got my glasses today. 1 through 7, and it reads Listen, O coastlands, to me. And take heed, you peoples, from afar. Yahweh has called me from the womb. And from the matrix of my mother, he has made mention of my name. And he has made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he has hidden me. And made me a polished shaft in his quiver. He has hidden me. And he has said to me, you are my servant, O Yisrael, in whom I will be honored. Then I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing, and it is in vain. Yet surely my just reward is with Yahweh, and my work with my mighty one. And now Yahweh has says, who formed me from the womb to be his Eber, his servant, to bring Jacob back to him so that Israel is gathered to him, because I will be honored in the eyes of of Yahweh and my mighty one will be my strength indeed he says it is too small a thing that you should be my Eber to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel I will also give you as a light to the Goyim that you should be my Hoshua salvation to the ends of the earth. See that? This is not about Yisrael right now, government leaving out of Egypt, going into Yisrael. This is bigger than that. This is this is 
it, is, it is resounds down to us today and past us to tomorrow. It's just not about bringing back Yaakov and even Israel, which is Ephraim, but it's about all peoples. All peoples. So, no, the law could not go in. Moshe could not go in. This has deep meaning, deep ramifications. The law is not going into the Kodesh Eretz. It's not going into the land. You're not going to be going to the land keeping bloody 613 commandments. You're not going to be doing that. So Moshe begins. He, went, he gave up on that. Now he is speaking, as I told you last week, the book we call Deuter Deuteronomy as a prophet. He's speaking as a prophet. He's no longer speaking as the oracle as he did from Mount Sinai all throughout all the instructions. He was speaking them as the oracle. Yahweh himself was speaking through him like you talking on a phone, like me talking on his mic on his mic right now. It is actually me, but it's going through a mic. When you're speaking on a phone is you speaking through a phone and someone is hearing it. You are the oracle on their phone. This is how Yah Moshe was to us, to Israel. But now he's speaking as a prophet, which is good, which means he's under inspiration of Ruach HaKodesh, under inspiration of Yahweh, but is not, is, is, he is in it. And you, and you can see a big difference when he recounts the Ten Commandments. And I'm probably not going to have time to go over that, but read it. I told you, uh, Deuteronomy 3, 23 through 7 and 11. Now, he talks about he, he, he talks about the laws he gave, the statutes and the judgments. They all have different meanings. Some of these laws that he gave, they understood. Some of them they didn't understand. It doesn't matter whether you understand or not. See, obedience is obedience. Think about it. Do you have, you know, husband and wives are a, a, a co-submissive, co-submissive. So it's not about one over the other. They have different jobs. Now, do you have a submissive wife if she only uh, submits to things that she agrees that you say or things that she understands that you say or does she submit to things regardless whether she understands or sees? If she only submits to things that she sees or understands, then she indeed is your head. She is not uh, truly submissive. And this is the same thing and, and vice versa, the things that you should submit to also. So the same thing goes here. You we are not to only obey laws from Yahweh that we agree to or that we understand. Submission is submission, period. So he says to observe these things, and observe doesn't mean just look at it, it means to do, to make. It's the Hebrew word is asa, to do, to make. See, here's the thing. Again, this is deeper than these people at this time. This goes back way in the beginning. After the flood, you had Shem, Ham, and Yafet. They were all given their lands to go to, and they vowed an oath and agreed in a covenant to do that. They didn't. They all hung around in Shem's land. But what's supposed to happen, they're supposed to go to their own lands, and then Shem receives a tour from Yahweh. He learns his ways, and he teaches it to the rest of the world. In the meantime, they're supposed to live by what we call the Noahide laws. They all had general laws of how to treat one another. They knew you don't just wake up in the morning and then go to something, get in your neighbor's bed and sleep with his wife. They knew that without no commandments. They knew you don't just get up and just kill somebody for the, heck, for the sake of it. They knew they didn't just plop their house and start building a house on someone else's land. The whole world was under general rules given to the entire world from the beginning. When you always said be fruitful and multiply, everyone knew the, what's what we call today the Noahide laws. And the whole world was supposed to go by them and then get the fine tuning from Shem uh, when he learned the Torah and teach it to them. But of course, this is not what happened. So it's supposed to happen now, at this time, with Moshe and Yisrael. They're supposed to teach the nations all around them. In the meantime, you know, when Yahweh gave these commandments, he titillated every sense our eyes, our ears, our taste, our touch, everything from Mount Sinai to inculcate in the sulcus of our minds these instructions. And we call them the laws, but they're really instructions. And, and yet, like I said, I gave a good example last week, that we cannot keep all these instructions even then. It's like when I said my daughter had an accident that she did not, in theory, not in theory, in actuality, she didn't break any laws. 
that turn that she made, she went according to the speed limit. But that day, that morning, there was a little a, a little light rain, and it was in the wintertime, and that rain froze into a thin sheet of ice. So even though she was keeping the law, the speed limit and all that, had a seatbelt on and lights and all that, she still had an accident. Because at that time, going by the speed limit laws caused her to have an accident. So she would really have to go opposite or, or do half of the, the laws limit the speed limit. You know, so same thing with the laws. You cannot keep all 613 because there's a, a non-verbal portion of it. And Israel didn't get that. And Moshe may not have gotten all of that. But it was all taught to us, taught to them at that time. And really only the aged women, the grandmothers and great-grandmothers, could have had the maturity to actually pass this on to the next generation. Because all the men were dead. And by after the Peor incident, all of the Erev Rav were purged out. So now Israel was going, going Yaakov was going into the land Israel with no Erev Rav. They were purged of all of Esau's seed. Now, of course, we know later they come in and we know what happens. But in the meantime, at that time, when they got baptized to the Jordan River, there was no Erev Rav there. And the best holders of the history was the grandmothers and great-grandmothers. Because all the men were dead and all the children they were young and they're growing up now but they wouldn't have didn't have the mature memory that their mothers and grandmothers and great-grandmothers had the women are really the nation because the Yahweh Shua came through the seat of the woman not the man Ruk HaKodesh overshadowed Miriam no man's seed tainted her Yahweh Shua did not come out of man of man's seed he came out of the woman who had blood, but then he was eternal water, so he was man and, and eternal. But no man seed, that's important to know. And so Yahweh titillated all of our senses to inculcate on our minds these commandments. Now, this is the same thing our slave masters did. They put fear into our forefathers and they did it through the mothers while we were in the womb. So man knows there is a way to really help increase our memory and to transfer generation to generation knowledge and information. So this is what Yahweh did. To this day, we have it in our hearts to love him and keep his commandments, but we don't have it in our might to do so. That's why he gave us chain, grace. He gave us grace as the bridge. And we will talk some more about that. We talk about that every week. In 15... Verse 15 of chapter 3, he says, Be wise, Yah is in all. No image can house him. And, and this is why, see, Shem is the only one that was entrusted and was supposed to get the Torah. And by extension now, Jacob and us. The rest of the world, Yahweh did not speak to them. They would have to, you know, that's why Yahweh is in everything. That is true. Yahweh did create the tree, right? So, of course there's a piece of him in a tree there's a piece of him in the sun and the moon and the stars birds and whatever he created those things but, but none of them singularly identifies Yahweh no dip more than your baby finger speaks everything about you no one can take off your baby finger and look at it and, and it tells everything about you or your left ear or your baby toe or your elbow or your eyeball or your lips there's no single part, ports of parts of you that can speak to all of you. This is why you do not create great graven image. You do not worship anything because though Yahweh indeed created all things and there's a part of him in them, they do not speak to Yahweh in his totality. That is something that is unseen. That's why he emphasized over and over again, you did not see any voice, any, any similitude. You only heard my voice. The words speak to you. Take these debarim with you in your leg. Ba'a leg. In your leg. Do not equate earthly blessings to having a relationship with me. See, think about it. The most vile, wicked man on earth still has the benefits of the sun. Just like you had the benefits of the sun. And the moon. And the stars. And, and the earth. So, do not equate your access to these things is having a relationship with him. Yahweh gives that to the just and the unjust. 
think about it if you have a mature thinking on it so we're saying that someone who is rich is righteous and someone poor is not righteous the rich person has more things than the earth so he must be more righteous this is the elementary thinking that they a lot of them had back then do not you have that today but we do have that today in these churches and even in some of our camps people equating whatever physical largesse and blessings they have to their relationship with Yahweh your relationship with Yahweh is predicated on your obedience we supposed to our unique relationship with him is based on our knowledge of him that's what I was quoting to you Jeremiah 9 24 of all the knowledge that we have the only one that matters the only one that we can boast about that should boast about is the knowledge of him because like the book says knowledge is increasing everyone has knowledge a 10 year old can look up on his smartphone and tell you uh, about knee replacements but can he do can he work for me as a physical therapist and on my patient that I have that has had a knee replacement no but he can look up and tell you all about the knee replacement so knowledge increasing but not understanding and not discernment the knowledge we need to know of is of Yahweh and then um, brought you out of in verse 20 he says I brought you out of a iron furnace now immediately that made me think about Yahweh didn't physically bring Israel out of iron furnace but he did bring them out of iron fur furnace of bondage immediately I thought about Abraham now last week I read something from Jasher I'm gonna do that again I'm gonna do that again because you need to get some of these books like Jasher and Book of Jubilees and that type of thing Jasher 12 22 to 26 read all of Jasher 12 but I'm going to just read verses 22 through 26 in chapter 12 of Jasher and this is about um, Abraham who was put into a furnace for his faith but he was put into the furnace by King Nimrod the first world's first king and the king's servants took Abram and his brother and they stripped them of all their clothes accepting their lower garments which were upon them and they bound their hands and feet with linen cords and the servants of the king lifted them up and cast them both into the furnace and Yahweh loved Abram and he had compassion over him and Yahweh came down and delivered Abram from the fire and he was not burned but all the cords of which they when it goes on I'm not gonna read all that yeah I will I'm gonna read these two verses but the cords which they bound him were burned while Abram remained and walked about in the fire and Haran died when they had cast him into the fire and he was burned to ashes because his heart was not perfect with Yahweh and those men who cast him into the fire the flame of the fire spread over them and they were burned and 12 men of them died and Abraham was in there for three days by the way so like he did back then like he did to the Hebrew boys and like he would do to you and me Yahweh delivers out of out of the world's fire fear not fear not as we go through our journey whatever they want to do to us in this day of fear this day of fear is going on throughout the whole world right now fear not then he goes on and talks about these commandments the 613 of which only a fraction of them can be kept can you enter into heaven only being a fraction of obedient I think not but once again this story this narrative is for them at that time to teach us today for us in our time for tomorrow they all have a connection because everything leads to Yahweh Shua who is the X-Man and if and if anyone cannot connect the Old Testament to the New Testament their ministry is useless it's useless because we must make a connection to how it's relevant for us today so in verse 24 Yahweh says I am jealous not just that Yahweh is jealous talking about um, this idolatry he says in Exodus 34 14 my name is jealous if Yahweh is jealous his name is jealous he says in Exodus 34 14 he means what he says we are not to, to uh, take our heart and, and lend it out to anyone else or anything else other than him Yahweh is to be the center of our hearts and this is a, a, a theme in this Torah portion and then he goes and talks about in verse 25 how this generation are eyewitnesses to Yahweh look at the history of the temple the temple was built 480 years after the Exodus 
and then um, it's still 410 years. Now this 410 years, I did about three teachings about this 400 years when people were talking about going back to Africa because I have 400 years in America. Well, the temple stood for 410 years. Do you think that Babylon, which we're in right now, will stand after 410 years? That's something to think about. We're about 402 years now. That's something to think about. I'm not saying that he's going to come, Yahshua is going to come in eight years, but there's a correlation between your imprisonment, your slavery, and Babylon. Think about it. So then in verse 27, there's a sig this is a signature scripture. In verse 27, he talks about how we will be scattered. Remember, Moshe is talking as a, speaking as a prophet now. He's saying we will be scattered. This is one of the hallmark signatures of who Yahweh's people are. There is no nation, no peoples in all the history of the world that have been scattered, forced out from a land. No one else qualifies with that identity. There is no one. There are peoples who travel on their own by their own volition. Some have may have been forced out of, many have been forced out of a land, but not then scattered to all corners of the earth. That is a identifying signature of Yahweh's people. And then he says in verse 28, when we go to those lands, that we're going to serve other mighty ones. Lord God, Jesus Christ. Remember in John 7, 5, I mean, John 5, 43. Yahweh, Yahweh Shua says that, you know what? You're not, called, you're not serving me by my name here. But then you're going to go to another place, another land. And there you're going to serve me by another name. John 5, 43. And that's what they're doing now. People call themselves serving the creator under another name. And this is what Moshe prophesied that was going to happen to us after we got scattered. We are scattered. We are serving false Elohim. And then those who are serving whom they call the true Elohim are serving him by another name. In verse 29, though, it's not all bad. He said in verse 29, from there, from these four points of the earth that we have been scattered, from there we will teshuva. From there we will return. From there. And right now we're in a period of waiting to teshuva. And that's in the latter days. So that speaks to Daniel. Let me read Daniel. Daniel 12, 4 through 13. Because that speaks to Daniel, what Moshe is saying here. We like reading Daniel Revelations. Daniel 12, 4 through 13. And it reads, But you, Daniel, Shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many will run to and fro, and knowledge will increase. Like I've been saying for, for a long time, yes, knowledge increases, but nowhere in here does it says discernment increases. Nowhere does it says that understanding increases. It says knowledge increases. Then I, Daniel, looked, and there stood two others, one on this riverbank and the other on another riverbank. And one said to the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river, how long will the fulfillment of these wonders be? Then I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river when he held up his right hand and his left hand to him, to Hashemayim and swore by him who lives forever that it will be for a time, times, and a half a time. And when the power of the Kodesh um, people have been completely shattered. All these things will be finished. So we see here, this is, I'm going to, I spoke about this last year in this very scripture about time, times, and half times. We're going to talk about it again once we finish the Torah portions. But this is a specific time, okay? Now we're going to talk about that now. But the key point I want to talk about now is that this is not going to end until we are completely shattered. I don't try, I'm not trying to get you depressed. This comes from the mighty Malachim of Yahweh who swore with both his hands up that it's going to only end when the power of the people, the Kodesh people, us, our power, the Kodesh people, not the world, has been completely shattered. For all you out there who think we're going to get better and better and we're going to bring us all together. Although I heard, I did not understand. Then I said, my master, what will be the end of these things? And he said, go your way, Daniel. 
go your way. Because the Bible, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. And this is the time of the end, the latter end. Many will be purified, made pure and refined, but the wicked will do wickedly and none of the wicked will understand, but the wise will discern. See what I'm talking about? Knowledge, the see the difference? The world has knowledge, but they do not understand. Me, you, we have knowledge and discernment, both. My knowledge is definitely increasing, but likewise, the correlated portion of that is my discernment, as should yours. And from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away until the abomination of the desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days. Now, people like to divide this up and try to understand when it's going to be. I'm going to give you the knowledge on that, not today. But the key I want to understand today is that we are going to be trampled like dust. And only at that time will we teshuva and come back to Eretz Yisrael. That straight from the book is not from me. And just like Yahweh brought, he says, um, he brought Yisrael out of Misraim. A nation was born in a day. That's going to happen again. I'm here. I go again. Let's go. Let's read Isaiah 66, 8 and 9. Isaiah 66, 8 and 9. Here I go again, making these tour portions relevant to us today. Here I go again. Isaiah 66, 8 and 9. And it reads Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such a thing? Will the earth be made to give birth in one day? Or will a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion was in labor, she gave birth to her children. Will I bring to, to the time of birth and not cause delivery, says Yahweh? Will I, who caused delivery, shut the womb, says your mighty one? See, Yahweh's not like us. He brings the birth pains, but he delivers. He delivers his word. We are the ones that deliver gas. We're the ones who deliver nothing. Yahweh delivers. And in one day, one day, we will be born. Right now, we're not a nation. We're just out here loud and proud and running our mouth with our fists up, not knowing jack. We are not a nation right now. Only Yahweh. Yahweh's the one that broke the whole world apart in the Tower of Babel. And then he allowed us to be scattered in Israel. So only he can bring us back. How if... Something supernatural and superpower like Yahweh just scattered everybody. How can a mere man bring everybody back together? It can't be done. Only he can do it. In the meantime, you live Kodesh. You live right. So then when he, he's going to birth the nation in one day. We're going to come together. And it's going to be after that sixth seal earthquake. I keep coming back to that. That's when it all begins on our journey. In the meantime, we only, he says in verse 35, we are the only ones who are supposed to teach this Torah knowledge. See, yet a lot of things I say here, people don't want to believe because I'm a so-called black man. If a white man or a Jew man or even a Spanish man say the same thing, they'll believe it. I have the sermon. Why? Because Yahweh says I have it. I am anointed by him and as you are. No different than you. No different than we. We're the let's let me Isaiah 59 21. Since we're already here in Isaiah, let's go back 59 21. And it reads, As for me, says Yahweh, this is my covenant with them, my Ruach, who is on you, Yehonathan. You can put your name in there, and my words, which I have put in your mouth, Yehonathan, will not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your descendants nor from the mouth of your descendants, descendants, says Yahweh, from this time, that means the day Yahshua spoke it, and to now, forevermore. Are we clear? Oh, maybe you're not. Let's go to a New Testament, two witnesses. Romans 3, 2. See, this word is supposed, this teaching, this knowledge is supposed to be given only from Yahweh's people. He ain't got a covenant with nobody else. Remember I said Moshe was the oracle. Well, you know what? Moshe's dead. So who's his oracle? Romans 3, 2. I don't mind for two witnesses, at least two. Let's go to New Testament, what you call the New Testament, the Brit Hadashah. 
what let's go to let's read verse one and two what advantage then has the Yehuda or what is the profit of circumcision much in every way chiefly because to them Yehuda you me us were committed the oracle the oracles of Yahweh it is committed to me it ain't committed to nobody who doesn't look like me no one doesn't look like you Yahweh's people the whole journey I've been telling you original words original truth the whole journey speaks to what Yahweh's people look like it tells you exactly what they look like the whole journey if you study the words if you in this particular if you study the names which are special words the entire journey speaks to Yahweh's people it speaks to him what he looks like as well it speaks to Yahweh shoot what he looks like and what his people look like and the oracles the very words that I'm giving to you now are entrusted to me and I'm giving it to you and this is supposed to stay with us until Yahweh Shua returns it's gonna bring us back together as a nation now in verse 37 again looking at the original words he talks about how Yahweh chose a seed now he's used a singular used us as a nation uses word zera singularly now how is that important you're not going to understand that and see that in the KJV because Abraham your brothers also came from Abraham but the covenant that was given to them and to us was through your code so that makes it more fine many are called but few are chosen because remember Esau also came from um, Isaac but Esau didn't come from Jacob. This covenant is from Yacob, that goes to us is from Jacob, not from Isaac. So it's a singular seed. This thing is seed versus seed. Read all of John eight, but I'm going to read John eight. Since y'all y'all love the Brit Hardish, y'all love the New Testament, so I'm going to read John eight, thirty one to forty seven. See something here that you probably haven't noticed before. John eight thirty one to forty seven. And this is Yahweh Shua. He says, Then Yahweh Shua said to those Yahudain who believed him, that means everybody, all the Yahudain, he was speaking to the Yahudain, the Yehuda, the, the Yisra, he was speaking to them, and all of them didn't believe. But to those who believed, he said this, If you abide in my Debarim, abide in my Debar, word, you are my disciple indeed. See? He says, if you abide in my debar, my word, you are my disciple. He said it to those who believed in him. All right? That's, that's John 8, 31. Now, in 32, he said, and you will know what he met. The, I mean, you will know how he met the truth, and the truth will make you free. So if you, be, if you believe in his word, you are his disciple, and then you know his word is true and then you're free that means we are free now we're not slaves now listen to the response to those who didn't believe that means those who also are from abraham right all right listen then they answered him we are abraham's descendants and we have never been in bondage to anyone how can you say you will be free hmm did we not come out of egypt was that not, what is all these tour portions about? Didn't we come out of Egypt? Then who are these Yahudain? Who are these people who say they've never been in bondage? I've been telling you every week, the Erev Rav, the Erev Rav, the Edomites, your brother, they were not in bondage. They snuck out with us because they put the blood on the lentil. And Yahweh, he didn't say only my people. He said anybody who put the blood on the lentil can, will, will be passed over. The era of Rob, they were never slaves. Esau has, does, has no history of being a, in bondage. None. Only us. Now listen to Yahweh, Yahweh Shua's response. Yahweh Shua said, Most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. And a slave does not ab abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. At Baal Peor, he finally purged these bastards out. The Erev Rav who was causing these problems and, and, and our bad leaders followed them throughout the whole time. 
from the golden ox on, they didn't, but when they came to the Jordan, they were gone. So they didn't abide forever. Now, of course, we know they came, the Arab Rav came back. But he purged them out. But the sons remain forever. The, now, verse 36. Therefore, if the sons make you free, if the son make you free, that means him, you are free indeed. Uh, and then, and listen, this is his direct response. And now he's going to come to the heart. In verse 37. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you, you seek to kill me. Because my word, my debar, has no place in you. I speak what I see, have seen from my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. Wow! <laughs> if I had to show far here, I would blow it. Y'all in sure cut him to the heart. Your father, and he read the whole thing. He tells him who their father is. Read verse 55, 58, and 59. Read the whole thing. Their father is Hasatan, the devil. That's what he said. But they came from Abraham's seed. How can they be from the devil? Did it ever rob? Did not Esau and Jacob come from the same womb? Two nations. And we're going to talk about that in the future. I talked about before in Matthew 24 when Yahweh Shua says nation versus nation. He didn't say nations and nations. And even Moshe said nation and nation. It's one nation versus another nation. It's Yaakov versus Esau. It is the brown seed versus the red seed. When they call it red now. That's what it is. If your feelings is hurt, it's because you're one of them. But you, for those who are of Yahweh, you should, be, you should be happy and proud and rejoice and be exceedingly glad. I can go deeper than this, but I don't have time. I really don't. I can see my time always runs out. That's why you need to read these tour portions and and buy the two books i have and and tune in all right now and in and, and, and verse 39 what yahweh is saying is you're not to know him intellectually we are to know yahweh i'm gonna make up a brand new word don't know yahweh intellectually because the devils know yahweh we need to know him relationshiply yeah i made a new word relationshiply know him by having a relationship i use this example many times because it's a good one a, a righteous man and righteous wife have intimate relations of course but they do not know that man does not know how his brother's intimate relations are with his wife you know two righteous men have two righteous wives they're separate they every everybody's intimacy is different i'm talking about righteousness now it's righteously different so we need to we all have intimacy with yahweh but each one of us yahweh he says in my house are many mansions he did not mean mansions as you think it means mikdosh Worship and praying places. So we need to know Yahweh in that manner. And in that manner, we see that Yahweh discerns his from the others. These people who hear that he was talking to, Yahweh, he, Yahweh sure knew their hearts. Yeah, you, yeah, you from Abraham, but you not from the covenant. Yahweh Thunder, we hear Yahweh for Christians on the, the famous WFBR 1590 AM. Now, I'm going to skip through a lot of this stuff. But in verses 6 through 18, of chapter 5 he recounts the Ten Commandments but now this is Moshe recounting the Ten Commandments as the prophet not as when he spoke them originally as the oracle and you will see if you read them there are some differences there I can elucidate to you on those differences I'm not going to do that here that takes time but there are differences there and they come about because of Moshe as a man as a prophet there are some, so that's why there, there are some differences in how they are said but we know in verse 29, he, Yahweh Shua, this is touching. And I, I, I'm going to do another, try to get a lesson on this. But he says, oh, that they would have a heart to fear me, Yahweh says. Yahweh is showing his heart. His heart hurt him. Why won't they just have a heart to love me? To just love me, don't be afraid of me, just to fear me spiritually. And this is the same thing he said, in, again, two witnesses in Matthew 23, 37. Oh, I was just like a hen. I had you try to get you, get you under my wings, and you just not didn't want to come. A week later, he was strung up on a tree. So Yahweh, he says this in, 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 in chapter five, verse twenty-nine of Bay Midbar of, Num, of, 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 Deuter of Deuteronomy, I should say, not Bay Midbar. That's Numbers of Deuteronomy, Debarim, and he says it in Matthew twenty-three, thirty-seven. The same thing. We just we just don't have a heart to love him and stay with him. Now I'm going to skip all the way down to the 
one of the most famous scriptures in the Old Testament, and that's uh, chapter 6, verse 4. And, and, and we all know it. And that is what they call the Shema. The Shema means to hear. Shema Yisrael Eliyahu Yahweh Echad. Hear Yisrael, Yahweh Almighty One. Yahweh is one. And he is. And this is because the first, you know who the first ever monotheist was? It was Abram. Abram was the first one to be to be a monotheist. And Yahweh chose him and separated him and had him cross over and then he became a Hebrew. Well, and then Israel is the first nation to be monotheist. All the other world were polytheistic. They looked at the sun, moon, the stars, the fish, the birds, the trees, and they, and they claimed creator was in all those things. And he is. But because they did not have the sermon, because they did not have the Torah, they did not have the covenant with Yahweh, they didn't understand that Yahweh cannot be captured in a, in a limited frame. You cannot house eternity into a frame of a fish or of a tree or of the sun or of anything, of the ocean, of nothing. Yahweh is eternal. You cannot frame him like that. Get him out of, don't, don't try to box Yahweh. So it goes on here to talk about loving Yahweh with all out, in verse 5, with all out lab, all out nefesh, all out me'od. And the sages say that we really don't have an English word for me'od, but we use it to mean power and might and strength. That means everything we have. If we love him this way, we'll see that love is an eternal motivator. We will never leave him, never depart from him. Fear is a temporary motivator. Fear, you cannot be always being obedient because of fear, because eventually you will come out of that fear. You're going to escape from it. You're going to defeat. You're going to do something. You're not going to live forever in fear. What you can live forever in is love. Shema Yisrael. And love Yahweh in verse 5. The following verse says, Of all your heart, all your soul, all your strength. Oh Yahweh, strengthen me. Your hometown to we to abide by Devarim 6 5. To love you with all my heart, all my might, and all my soul. Now, goes on down to verse 7. Our main topic of conversation. He talks about how we need to talk about, since we love him so much, as we wake up, as we go throughout our day, as we lie down, as we sleep, as we transition, as we do whatever, we're supposed to talk about him. You talk about things you love, you just, this is supposed to be learning. In doing this, you learn, learn more the Torah, and when you learn the Torah, you learn that it is all about Yahweh Shua. This is why so many of us are thinking that this is old stole commandments is gone and done because they're not connecting it to their lives today. This day, what they call the 29th of August, 2021, of how it applies to our lives this day because we have a relationship lead, a new word I made up, uh, with Yahweh. We are, we are intimate with him and we know that this is all about his son who breached through over and came and brought us back to him. He reconciled us to him. To him. He reconciled us to him. Not to stones, two tablets of stones from Sinai. He recon reconciled us to him. He says in verses 17 to 25 to teach our children so they can know their history. Knowing your history breaks the chains of slavery. Do you think that those black souls who were being whipped by someone didn't like them. And you believe you think if all those slaves knew that the man in the book that they was preaching looked like them, that they would continue to be whipped like that? Do you think that how can the righteous man do so much devilish stuff? We didn't know who we were. And we're learning today because knowledge is increasing. And it's going to take great men and women anointed and blessed by Yahweh to teach this thing so we can have discernment and learn we need discernment and learn we can't just have knowledge because knowledge is not enough 
And then when he goes on to chapter 7, verses 1 through 3, this is most, and you know what was, <laughs> it became profound to me, and I was, as I was reading this, is that while, while Shea is recounting all this, and he gave the, the reading of the Ten Commandments the second time, that he's doing this in the land of, of Gog. Remember the land where they, 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 they killed the, the giants. They killed the giants. So this is the on the east of Jordan. They are currently, while he is speaking to them, this shows that if they follow Yahweh, if they believe in Yahweh, that they can destroy giants. They are in the middle of the land of giants who are no longer there. They had destroyed them. And now they had the land, um, the tribe of Reuben, the tribe of God, and the half tribe of Manasseh was going to stay in that land, the land that they had, that were formerly inhabited by giants. That they were in so much fear that they spent 39 years wandering the wilderness because they were afraid to go in. So finally, Yahweh allowed them to, 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 to go in and move forward, and they destroyed these giants. After all those years of fear, what giants are in your life? What giants are in your, your life that you need to slay? I know I, I was in fear. It took me a long time to go ahead and finally go and start writing. It took me a long time to go ahead and start going on social media and start and then and, and doing this. I love the old school analog. I love the radio. This because I'm old. That's old school. But it took me a while to have the courage to go do this, and I'm getting better at it. But it's still every day. I have to pray. I don't just do this. Is not a natural thing, but this is what I've been called to do. And chosen to do, even more more importantly, chosen by Yahweh to do. This these are giants I'm slaying here. What giants are keeping you out of Eretz Yisrael? What giants? While this whole tour portion is being spoken, they are in the land of the giants that used to be there. That's proof evident right there under their feet what they can do. Do not fear. Do not fear. Then in verse Four, he goes and talks about how mixing is idolatry. Remember, Yahweh is one. When we go into this land and conquer it, number one, well, yeah, we're going to conquer. Do not take on their ways. Why do you think Yahweh is dispossessing them? If they were living by the Noah hot laws, see, they didn't have the covenant. That's fine. If they were just living by doing to others as you had them doing to yourself, Yahweh wouldn't dispossess them. Not like that, anyway. Because the land belonged to Shem. But they didn't know what had been destroyed like that. But they were being dispossessed because the land could not tolerate them. Why go into the land and follow after their evil, wicked ways? We were not to mix with them. We were not to intermarry with, with them. We were not to keep covenant with them. Remember, Yahweh even had the 12 tribes not mix. He separated us by tribes. The first census was done with us as a whole conglomerated group. The last census that was done before, the first census that was done after coming out of, out of the, uh, coming across the Red Sea, we were all one group. The last census before Jordan, we were in 12 separate tribes. And then 13, if you want to count the Levites. We were separated. We were supposed to go into the land, separated in our own tribes, because we each have our own separate calling. We were not even supposed to mix with each other, let alone with the world. Some of us are not getting along together now because we're in different tribes. We're not going to ever be all get along until that last great day. Well, not the last great day, I'm sorry, before the last, that, that's, that's the eighth day of, of tabernacles and then the millennial kingdom. But the, the we're not going to all get together after that, that sixth, sixth plague earthquake when Yahweh Shua brings us all, gathers all back together and we have three and a half years to get to the Kodesh land. So yes, you still have to live with us, do what's right, but do not expect for us to be all kumbaya. It's not going to happen. It can't happen because Yahweh separated us. How can a man bring us all back together? In the meantime, you're not supposed to do all this mixing. Yahweh says in verse 6, we are Kodesh. We are a Kodesh nation. We are his Kodesh nation. He said he chose us. And he says in verse 7, not because of any great merit of our own. It's because he loved us. 
And why did he love us? You know it ain't because of us looking at us. It's because he knew his eternal seed was going to come through us. Yahweh Shua HaMashiach. Who came through Miriam when Ruach HaKodesh overshadowed her. And he couldn't do that in filth. She couldn't be a hoe. She couldn't be slinging, her, slinging left and right, right and left. We cannot be hoes slinging it around because y'all cannot come out of filth. He cannot do that. So he says he loves us. And then he says in verse 9 that he keeps his covenant. That's why he did it. He keeps his covenant. Yahweh is not like us. He doesn't change his mind because now we changed our mind. Because now we did him wrong. He's going to go ahead and say, nope, he changed his mind. No, what he did was he continues the revelation. The revelation from Abraham is a little bit different than it was to Yishak. And the one from Yishak is a little bit different than the one to Yaakov. But see, if you read it with an immature mind, you don't get it. You don't get it. Now, I do have two announcements. Next week, um, thanks, Mr. Moran. I appreciate that. Keep me on point. He's really make, helped making this a smoother transition. Next week, um, we're going to have Yom Teruah is coming. Yom Teruah is coming. is on September 8th. So on the 4th, the next, we're going to do a Yom Teruah broadcast. So we're going to hold off on tour portion number 46. Also, I want to have another announcement. My dear Ahodi, Sarah Yah Stevens, uh, owner of Represent Products, something for you and something else for you too. Quality gifts for thoughtful spiritual and cultural occasions. They have a yard sale today at 3417 Milford Mill Road or you can call her directly at 443-802-5011. That's Sarah Yard Stevens. You can call her directly at 443-802-5011 for represent products. Something for you and someone else too. Shalom Malakim. Peace be on you. Into the clouds of the day, yeah. I can see the light as the clouds break away. Now the water will be stand as it wash away sin. It will show a new era from beginning to the end. Slipping out of faith, y'all words can describe the love that you show me is more than life. It's more than life.